Good evening, everyone, and a big warm welcome to you all. The book suggested by Michael Pollock and being introduced to us by him this evening is The Greatest Comeback. The story of Bella Gutman is, as it says on the cover, from genocide to football glory. In 1961, as coach of Benfica, he lifted one of football's greatest prizes, the European Cup, a feat he repeated the following year. Rising from the death pits of Europe to become its champion in just over 16 years, Gutmann performed the single greatest comeback in football history. Over to you, Michael. Um, good evening, and I'd like to thank Simon for inviting me. And this time the invitation was um, even more attractive than usual because he said to me that for the first time ever, I can choose the book. And who would have guessed I chose a book about a Hungarian Jew, which is um, my, uh, on my father's side, we, we are Jewish and Hungarian. And it was about football, which is something which has distracted me for, for, for many years. So I was really delighted to be able to get the choice and actually bring this, I think, tremendous book to your attention. I've got a bit of a reputation for uh, being unkind about the books um, in these evenings, but this, this one was, was written for me. So first of all, I had to declare um, a sort of biographical interest because the amazing Bella Gutmann uh, lived this astonishing life but it has so many parallels to my own father's life. And I'd just like to point those out. Um, it was, yesterday was the 55th, 50, 51st yard site of his passing. So um, maybe it's appropriate that we're, we're looking at a book that resonates so much of his life. So of course, Bella Goodman shared a first name with my father. My father was known as Bela. Um, in common with Central Europeans, he had a whole host of other names. And depending on what, what he was doing and where he was, he was variously called Victor, Wojtek, Bela, Baby. But apparently his real name was Bela, so that, that, that's something that they share. Um, and although Bela Gutman was actually born in Budapest, his uh, family came from that part of Hungary, which has disappeared into the Ukraine, um, which is Transcarpathia. I'm, I'm not going to try and pronounce the names of the villages that his parents came from. Um, most Hungarian words have a whole sequence of up to five cons consonants in a row without any vowels. And these towns are similar, so I, 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 I won't have a go. But um, the, the villages that his father came, his parents came from are just down the road from the village the, that we came from. And I noticed that even um, in, the, in the great football team, Hakar Vienna that uh, um, Gutmann played for, there was the, was Egon Pollack space, spelt very rarely exactly as I spell mine. So maybe I can claim some kind of familial connection through the football pitch. But the connection which really sticks out, which I, th which I think I'll come back to, is I remember my father was, uh, it's fair to say, wasn't the most religious person ever to stride the earth, but he was um, very attached to, to Judaism and to, to the, 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 the customs and thoughts of Judaism. Uh, I remember when I was about seven, um, queuing up in the rain to go and see a rabbi. And the rain was pouring down. And I knew that that wasn't our thing, going to see, standing in the rain, queuing up to see rabbis. So um, I finally asked my father, why are we getting wet in a queue to see a rabbi? So my father told me that we were going to see Rav Yolish of Satma. So that is Yol Teitelbaum, the, the, the first Rebbe of Satma. Satma is a town in Romanian, in Romania, which is um, amusingly based on the Romanian name Satumare, which is probably St. Mary's, that he had come. And my father said, shh, you should know, when this man blesses you, you're blessed. And when this man curses you, you're cursed. So we're, we're going to make sure we're going to get a, a, a blessing. Um, you know, here, here we are, uh, 61 years later, and it hasn't gone too badly. So I guess my, my father was right. His evidence for the power of this man's curses, that, that when they got to 
this, the, this particular group of uh, family of rabbis spread out over Hungary, conquering the various villages. And their mode of conquest was cursing that they, they, if the rabbi, local rabbi stood up to them, they would issue some kind of curse. And according to the history book of our village, um, they cursed my um, uncle's uncle, who was the Dayan at the time. And uh, to quote the book, some time later he died. Now, I'm not quite sure whether this was 40 years later, but it was, it, 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 the link was close enough to be able to say that um, they had the power to, to, to curse. So my dad schlepped me over there to make sure that we got on the right side of this particular um, Jewish witchcraft, maybe. So we're, we're, we're linked, I'm linked by the curses uh, uh, as well. Um, so let's, uh, what I really like about the book is first of all, obviously it's just an amazing story and we'll, we'll look at some of the amazing things, but I think as a piece of writing, it works so well as well. So uh, the thing that jumps, jumped off the page to me that really sort of caught my attention early on um, is the whole story of Hakkar Vienna. Hakkar Vienna is a Jewish football team founded in 1909 and has to make its way up the Austrian uh, le leagues and makes it from the fourth division to the first division over a period of 11 years. So I don't, you know, I, I, it, it, it's as if, I don't know, HMH or Hendon United suddenly won the, 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 cha the premiership. It sort of seems to me totally unlikely. And the stories that come off the football side of this are so often um, almost Kafkaesque in, in, in their strangeness. Um, the winning goal in the season that they won, the winning goal in the winning match, which sealed the premiership for um, Hakkar, was scored by their goalkeeper. Okay, that, that can happen. But why was the goalkeeper in the opposition penalty area? Because someone had fouled him and broken his arm. And there were no substitutes in 1920. So he put his arm in the sling and he was told to play out front. And there he was trotting around, presumably in a lot of pain with his arm in a sling. And the ball arrives, he scuffs the ball. It goes off an, uh, uh, an opposing player and ends up in, in the goal. I mean, you, uh, and let me just mention, his name is Alexander Fabian and he should be remembered uh, like the rest of the team. He, he's Jewish. Um, and you wouldn't see it at Hackney Marshes. The, over and over again, we get this account of chaos in football, and it, it emphasizes the relentless awfulness of the other side of the story. And Bolshova bounces tremendously effectively between the ludicrousness of football and how fortune is determined in football with the absolutely opposite um, determined, relentless, machine-like um, world of the, of, of the Holocaust, where de conscious decisions were made to kill hundreds and thousands of people, and that actually happened. And the way, I think the way he goes from one minute, the ball is hitting the post and going in, and the next minute, divisions of, of German armor are coming into, in, into Hungary. And I think it it, it, it really shows how the level of intentionality, how well planned, how, how the degree to which awful human beings, this isn't something that just happened, just happened is what's happening on the football pitch, that the goalkeeper with his hand in a sling happens to stick out his foot. That's a just happened. The, the story of the Holocaust is not a just happened. It's, a, it's an awful story of human evil human genius in planning this or this terrible evil and i think that from 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 the moment he starts talking talking about how often amusing the events on the football pitch were um as as he moves through um back to the holocaust the, the, this contrast works um amazing amazingly well um he he refers to the Hungarian Holocaust um, as being taking place in 1944. And that's something in itself that was remarkably awful. Um, 
um, 600,000 Jews were killed roughly in the period between May and July of 19, 1944. But of course, the Germans had no business allocating precious resources to killing Jews in 1944. The, the, they would have been worried about exactly um, where the, the channel, where and when the channel crossing was going to take place over, over, over the next year. Um, the Italians had lost in Monte Cassino, their, their, their war effort was finished. So Ger Germany was open to, to, to the South. Um, North Africa was lost to the Germans. Who, whoever put his hand up and said, well, let's kill 600,000 Jews should have been shouted down. But Eichmann put his hand up and said, it's time to kill 600,000 Jews. And even though it was totally counterintuitive, it's not what they needed to do. Um, the importance of killing Jews was, was um, unfortunately so much uppermost in their mind that the, a rational person would, would say that they couldn't possibly have thought of doing it. But nevertheless, they did manage to, to organize and round up the, the Hungarian Jews in that very short period, most of whom ended up in, in, in Auschwitz. Um, and as I say, Churchill called it the greatest evil. Um, and I think it's right. I think when someone commits evil for the sake of evil against their actual self-interest, because that's what they want to do, that is a, a, a very remarkable type of, type of, type of evil. Um, I'd like to also um, mention the picture of Gutman that we get uh, uh, of the person. And I, I, I'm, I'm risking this. I, I think we end up liking him. He's so flawed. Um, he's an, you know, he's he's a gambler, and he, he seems to, to have liked the occasional drink. And he's he's definitely not a good Jew. He he, he marries out, and in um, the book he wrote about his life in the early 1960s, there's no mention of the Shoah, there's no mention of his Jew Jewish roots. Um, but you grow to like him. You know, he's, a, he's, he's a bit of a rascal, but he's hugely talented. He has, um, he has a plan. Um, he understands football at a level. It's going to take football maybe 20, 30 years to catch up with him. If you sort of think of how scientific and how precise and how detailed his plans were, and come across Europe and, and have a look at what's going on um, in the UK um, with sort of cl clearly charismatic managers, that the idea of really attending to detail in the way that Gutmann was, that's going, we're, we're going to have to wait till um, something much later in the century um, with the arrival of people like Wenger into the, in, into the UK to bring that. So he was he, he was a rascal, he wasn't a good Jew, but he was um, a great football manager and clearly had a, a very charismatic um, effect on, on those around him. So I think his personality um, does carry a lot of the book, but ha ha what an interesting person he, he is. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the paragraph that describes um, that... Uh, uh, this is him writing about uh, his life. Um, it, it was done, it was, it was written jointly. So this is in the third person, um, and I'm on page 108. In the last 15 years, countless books have been written about the destructive years of struggle for life and death. That's, what he, that's his description of, of the Shoah. It's destructive years of struggle for life and death. It would therefore be superfluous to trouble our readers with such details. Um, and that's it. That's the that's the um, the Holocaust years um, absolutely dealt with. Um, so, and I, I think as we as we go through the book, um, you know, um, the events in football are so so chaotic and so random. You know, he discovers. Uh, perhaps the greatest, if not the second greatest footballer on the planet at the Barbers. He's gone to have a haircut and he bumps into some bloke and he said, I've got the man for you. And 
99% of us would say, get lost, I'm having a haircut. But Gutman says, ah, who is he? And he chases down Eusebio, brings him into the team, wins uh, the European Cup and launches the career of one, one, one of the greatest players of all time. So that whole world of football is so beautifully depicted in its random and chaotic, chaotic sense and goalkeepers, goalkeepers in slings scoring goals and balls coming in off the post to, to change the direction of, of a match. And um, it's, it, it's, so, it's so irrational. And I think that standing alongside the stuff about the Shoah, which is presented in a completely different way, I think is hugely powerful. And as I said at the beginning, I, I, I honestly think that this book has real literary merit in the way that he weaves the, the Shoah story in between the ludicrousness of, of the football story. Um, so, uh, and ju just, you know, the, the, the way he brings Eichmann in, as, you know, Eichmann is also this um, squat, bald, central European. And he, you know, he, Eichmann is going to kill as many Jews as possible in a relentless, organized way and represents evil in the book. And humanity is, is represented by this little bit of a scoundrel, Bella Gutman. But that's what good people are. You know, good people make a mess of their lives, manage to, to, to come out of it, make a mess, do stupid things, scramble out of it, scramble out of it again. And I think it becomes such an optimistic book that um, humanity will prevail. Um, dis despite the fact that um, every now and then we descend to, to real evil, that the, the amazing persona of Bella Gutman, who's all of us, I mean, he's, he's, not, he, he's, he's no better, absolutely no better than the majority of us. Um, nevertheless, he prevails and somehow humanity wins out. So I'm going to, to stop there. I think I've said, said quite a lot um, and um, I'll ask people, I'm going to pick on you, Simon. So, Simon, what, what, did, what did you make of the book? Um, so, kind of a sad reflection of Bella Gutman's life, actually, is, yeah, he was a star player. Um, the Holocaust came along, and so he kicked off with his coaching 10 years later than he otherwise would. He was a terrible gambler. So was his wife, Marianne. Um, as a result, the concept of his uh, carrying on till age 75, in other words, older than all the oldest managers we've had, and they were playing in, you know, Man United, Newcastle, etc. He was playing with, he was managing rubbish teams by, by the last, but, and why? And the answer seems to be because he was desperate for money, because actually he was gambling so badly and so much he needed the money. And actually, when you, as you get towards the end and you hear about Marianne who died, 19 years after he did, she's actually in an unmarked grave because she had you know, 400 quid in the bank, owing 15 grand to the equivalent to, to the home she was in, et cetera, et cetera. So as a reflection of his life and how, how what, what came of him and his genius and yet his failings is also quite sad as, much, as, well, as, as well as how remarkable his achievements really, really were. As you said, a manager so ahead of his time in his planning, in his managing the press, in his et cetera, et cetera, and his teams, the working on and so on. So yes, yeah, so I, I think it's it, it's both amazing and yet it's also sad. I was actually speaking to someone uh, a week ago uh, about the book, and they they found it really difficult. They said, "Look, you know, you the Holocaust isn't it isn't fun. You either write a grim book about the Holocaust, or you write a fun book about football, um, and to have them." Both with, um, competing for space within the same cover is 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 offensive, and I think that the authors actually pulled it off brilliantly because we do see the the true grimness and evil of the Holocaust because it's competing for space in this chaotic story about about football, um, and I I feel that it actually works very well. It's sort of one of the because it's it, 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 it's not so consistently grim that you you almost lose connection with the events 
Um, there's bright lights and then there's darkness. And that contrast helps you really understand how, how awful the events were. And for, um, my grandparents were killed in 1944 when they were rounded up in their Hungarian Hungarian village and, and sent to, to Auschwitz. Um, and that was just a sort of a, of a fact, really. I, I, I'm not sure I'd really connected to it. But when I did, when I read this book and I was able to see, hold on, some people are playing football, some people are moving to Vienna. You know, this is a this is a real world of real Jewish people. And coming into that world came this awful evil. Um, I I did feel that I managed to connect in a way not necessarily previously. So I I really got felt that the book was a big success. I mean, just to add to that, and I'll shut up after this because other people really must speak, not me. Um, you do though see the anti-Semitism continuing throughout, and you, he hardly yeah. says anything about it. And there's a page in the book that says he hardly says anything. At one point, he says something, and then it lists all the kind of succession of how he was acted against the Wonder Rabbi or something they called him. Um, yeah. So, so despite the Holocaust, the anti-Semitism continued. Yeah. I, I even think in the curse, there's a sort of anti, you know, the Jews are capable of doing this, so we better get on the right side of them. Even that seemed to have an anti, anti Semitic um, element to it. So um, I could pick on people and ask them what, what they think. <laughs> so um, so um, I, um, Helen. Did you have to? <laughs> well, you can call in your husband for this. So uh, he's, perfect team, because he's the football expert uh, and you're the no, he gets, he's, expert. He's having supper. <laughs> he's, having, <laughs> he's having supper. We're sitting in our garden. The spokesman. So wow. as, as, as a Holocaust um, <laughs> expert, how did you enjoy the football? Is the... Well, it was, there, was, <laughs> there was a lot of football, actually. Um, I thought the story was excellent. And I, as I actually agree with you, he weaved it in beautifully. And it was very good. He weaved, he wove it, wove it in, wove it in beautifully. <laughs> weaved it in. He wove it in beautifully. Um, and it told the story, which I think is what it was. Wanted to do. There was a bit too much football in it for me, actually. But um, I found yeah. that I found it interesting, and even the football bits were interesting. But uh, uh, but it was a very good book. Now it was a good book, and as you say, I think I. I mean, he was a scoundrel, and it was sad that he ended up with no money. But then he'd already lost all his money by 1929, it said, or 1930, in the Great Depression. He had money, and then he lost it. So he really spent his life scrabbling around for money. And maybe that's, you know, he was obviously a very talented coach, but uh, maybe his life and the way he moved around was because he needed the money where he could get the best deal and he genuinely needed the money. Right. Was he scarred by the Holocaust? He was obviously a difficult character even before, so it seems. He was a tough cookie before. Uh, um, did it, maybe it made him tougher, but I think he was always going in that direction. I don't know what other people think. Right. Um, th those of us who have an interest in football, where are the better equipment now? Where's the Hakkar Vienna? Why is that that ph phenomenon that you could put on a Jewish football team to win the, the, the Austrian first division? Um, I don't think you could put on a Jewish football team to, to, to win the Istamian League if it still exists. Um, I don't think uh, we are. What, what's what was going on in Vienna and what's happened in the UK that we, or anywhere in the world, there anywhere. are no Jewish sports teams that are successful? Uh, well, my, the my theory is, and I have told my boys this when they used to play, <laughs> is that Jewish boys don't head the ball. <laughs> they need to keep their brains for other things. <laughs> well, <laughs> but why? why, why um, because you get dementia if you head the ball. <laughs> <laughs> it's against nature to, to, to head the ball. Okay. Um, <laughs> Neil, we don't know each other, so hello, Neil. Um, but you look very healthy. You look like there's been a life of playing football and keeping fit. Is that... You're, you're, you're muted, I'm sorry. You're still slightly muted or very muted. There we go. Is that better? Ah, brilliant. Neil. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um... Well, 
I have to confess, first of all, I read the book about two years ago. I went to JW3, met David Bolchover uh, at that particular time. A lovely uh, afternoon it was. And um, when I saw this come up, I thought, well, I've just got to um, go through it maybe all, all over again. So I have to confess, I, I don't remember too much about the book. But what I do remember, um, what comes to mind, is something that's not in the book. Uh, as a Mad Spurs fan, um, I was at the Spurs Benfica match back in April 1962, one of the three great games that I, I, I ever saw Spurs play. And um, we, we just failed to go through. But at the end of the match, he turned around to the press and he said, I know that this Spurs team is going to win a European trophy in the very near future. And, and they did. This season, they won the European yeah. Cup Winners Cup. It was absolutely phenomenal. So the man had this knack, didn't he, of uh, always predicting the future. Right. Uh, yeah, Neil, I was there too. I'm not a Spurs fan, but um, my, my father took me to anything to do with Benfica or, or Bella Gutman, so we, we, we had to go, apparently. Um, so I, I was there. I didn't know that he'd said that, that Spurs will win. You see, I, I, it's, yes, yes. It's in the world of Hungarian Jews, curses are curses and blessings are blessings, and they, they, that, that seems to be an, an, an important an important principle. How was um, David Bolchover? Very, very pleasant man. Yes, we really spoke for a few seconds, actually. And I, in fact, I, I told him that particular story, and he nodded, right. he nodded as if to say, yes, absolutely, absolutely right. But right. when we talk about um, Jewish teams, I mean, I've been connected mainly through my son with London Lions under McCarthy Lions, and right. uh, their first team, uh, the Saturday team, plays in the South Midlands League. Uh, which is a pretty decent standard. Not that far really behind the, uh, the, the what you would call, I think you mentioned the Isthmian League. And, and they've won the South Midland League on, on, on one occasion. They won it six, seven years ago. And they've won cups over the years, um, pretty senior cups. So we're not talking about Maccabi football. We're talking about almost semi-pro football. So there's a group of boys who are capable of playing at a pretty good standard. And most of those boys actually go represent Britain in the Great, in great Britain in the Maccabee Games. So you've virtually got a Great Britain Jewish football team there. And it's very surprising actually that more people don't go and see that sort of football because it's a pleasure to watch. Uh, and they're, they're, so that there is the ability, there are Jewish boys out there who if they took the game seriously, maybe could match the Hakkas of this world. Right, and does Wingate still exist? Yes, but it, 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 there's no Jewish players there. There's, there are junior football. Um, my grandson actually plays for Wingate under nines. Um, half the team is Jewish, half the team isn't Jewish. So it's not, but Maccabi Lions is, is a completely Jewish team. But Wingate, the first team that plays in the, is it the Eastman League? I'm not sure. Uh, I think the last Jewish player to play for them, Scott Shulton, was about three, four years ago. And it's waned and waned and down, down completely. So it's non-Jewish. Yeah, uh -huh. Okay. Um, uh, Lee, I'm afraid to say I'm going, going to pick on you, despite the fact that you, you're a little bit in the dark, as it were. Um, so could I ask you, what, what did you make of the, of the Holocaust part of it? Did you think it was not an appropriate <laughs> setting to yeah. talk about? Well, I haven't read the book yet, actually, but I have just put it on the wish list and it, I will be ordering it from Amazon because okay. uh, your, your talk is really interesting and, and uh, we're both really keen football fans, Arsenal fans, actually. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're certainly interested to read a book that combines the, the, the Holocaust but and the When football. you're talking about Jewish footballers, our local team these days is Maccabi Haifa. Because we actually live in Haifa, although we're just visiting England for the first time in, in nearly two years. So uh, there are quite a lot of Jewish players in Israel who are not bad. And, uh, you know, it's uh, of course, they're not around here in England. But in Israel, although the teams are very mixed because there are these days, I must say, plenty of Arabs playing in the... Uh, especially in the Jew Maccabi Haifa, Haifa, that's normally yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, a majority <laughs> Arab team. Quite a few, quite a few uh, imports as well these days. But uh, yeah, Israel puts out reasonable effort these days in the international scene. I mean, uh, it, it, they always start very, very optimistic about getting into the World Cup uh, qualifying rounds and uh, the European Cup and what have you. And of course, at the end of the day, there's always 
even if they win the first few matches, the disappointment comes along. But uh, anyway, it'll be very interesting to read the book because my parents were also Holocaust survivors from Germany. And so I'm always interested. Your father in... supported Arsenal in the 1930s before he, he ever knew he was going to come, come and live in North London. Yeah, yeah. So we have some ins and outs, but it'll be interesting right. to read the book. And you certainly have piqued our interest, that's for sure. Right. Okay, that's good. Simon, have we, have, have we got a, a, a rebate system going with Amazon for any sales of the book over the next 48 <laughs> hours? <or> <laughs> I will attempt yeah. to negotiate, but I think I'm going to fail. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, it's perfectly it's all right. It's We're happy, happy for Mr. My dad, to get his royalties. <laughs> my dad was from Germany too, but he was an Eintracht Frankfurt supporter, apparently. Oh, well, that didn't go well in 1961, I think it was, wasn't it? Was it? <laughs> didn't they lose? Yes, I think, I think something like this. So, so Michelle, I, I'm going to do this to you, to, 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 to you. Have you had a chance to look at the book at all? No, I have to admit, I bought it for Howard from the football aspect, um, mm. and I think he's enjoyed it, but yeah. it's on the list, it's on the coffee yeah. table, comes you know, to me next. Yeah, I was, at that, I was also at that match, the, uh, the semi-final in the European Cup, uh, was, ah. with first loss. I think Dave Mackay <laughs> broke his leg, there. I can't quite remember, but uh, I remember the floodlights in those days, uh, you know, they weren't very, they weren't like they are today, they were quite dim. <laughs> Uh, one of the I can't remember who was that one. One of the ties was was um, delayed because of, because of fog. That was the following it was, season. It was, it, and they played they played at a later time. <laughs> but I, I don't think it was the semi final. It might have been earlier round. But uh, it was uh, quite disappointing that they didn't you know, didn't make the final. <laughs> uh, what, what is the likelihood of a random selection of fifteen people? Three of them were <laughs> the football. Match. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Obviously, all football fans, yeah, which is yeah. why the book piqued my interest to give it yeah. to Howard. Yeah, well, Tottenham was a great side there, but they, 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 it wasn't like today. Was some of the sides were able to keep it going, or Spurs was like a continual decline after that. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. because they came up against the Gutman curse, obviously that was the, yeah, that, 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 and another victim. So, Michelle, yeah. when you read the book. It's about my dad. It's definitely <laughs> 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 with a very loud voice. <laughs> A very loud voice, very doesn't do, doesn't allow other opinions in the room, and it's his oh. way or no way. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the the idea that he liked the occasional bet was was certainly um, resonant yeah. with with me. Um, Johnny Lawfer, hello, you know a thing or two about football. Johnny, you, you, are you there, or have you gone off to get a drink? He's gone off to get a drink. Can okay, I just well, say, uh, back to your question, back to your yeah. question about is, did anyone find, I find it offensive? Uh, I didn't find it offensive. I thought it was actually very, very clever, very well written. My credentials are that my father, for those of you who know him, played in the Rosvadov football team. Oh, so wow. There you are. <laughs> who the Rosvadov football team. <laughs> The Rosvadov football team. Who would have thought? Eh? <laughs> who, 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 in, indeed. Um, in, what in, did he play? In, in Poland. I have no oh. idea. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, he was very proud of it. There was a Rosvadov football team. This was a shtetl, probably of about less than 2,000 people in Galicia. Um, but they liked their football. They also, obviously, football was a very big game. Uh -huh. You know, then, which is what we can see. But right. I do find it interesting how there was this Jewish football team, and there were so many Jewish football teams in Hungary and Czechoslovakia and Vienna. It's uh, in fact they were based. Hakoch Vienna, Vienna Hakoch were based in Leopoldstadt, Michael. Yes, yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> which um, is back on stage. Um, I hear, I saw. Back on stage in the beginning of August, and tickets are on sale now. And I'm told they'll be very, they're very grateful. I, I picked up the slightly strange job of being the religious advisor um, to Tom Stoppard's last play, um, Leopold Stuck, and spent some time with them at, uh, at rehearsals, trying to get, the, get it right. Um, and I think the, 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 the interesting lesson was that um, they, they had a um, part, uh, I think it was in the first, no, maybe in the second second act, there's a there's a scene where they're having a seder night so that many of you may have seen already. And when they initially rehearsed the seder night, um, 
it just didn't sound right. It just didn't sound the way. So I, I said to the actors, I said, when Jews get together, we don't let each other finish sentences. It doesn't go like that. We don't say something and then wait and someone politely then comes in after we finish the sentence. We cut off each other's sentences. It's not it's it's not because we don't like each other. We're just so eager to say what we have to say. Um, so they they rehearse this means of talking where you don't let anyone get to the end of a sentence before you chop in yours. And they and and they they did that that scene for me in that style, and it remained in uh, in the play itself. And it was amazing. It was just like being at home at a Seder night where no one, no one lets anyone end, end, end a sentence. It was, it was absolutely magnificent. Uh, and my, my other great contribution was um, in Tom Stoppard's original, um, in 1921, someone is given the gift of a bottle of malt whiskey by a textile supplier in, um, in Scotland, I think. Um, and I had to explain to the great Tom that uh, malt whiskey was not available as a retail product in 1921. And uh, he was very impressed. I, I was there for my rabbinic credentials, which weren't called upon all that often, but I was able to offer some very useful information on, on, on whiskey. So, so Tom and I, uh, he, he, he was intrigued by this whiskey drinking, whiskey drinking rabbi. Um, his story, um, is absolutely so please go and see Leopold Schatz. it's 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 very much related to this world which Gutman's coming out of of uh, a generation of Jews desperate to leave Jew being Jewish behind they've left the shtetl of eastern Europe they've come to Vienna and they they, they uh, to put it uh, they want to be Gentiles they want to be like everyone else they want to be they want to be normal and the world isn't going to let them because um, the world wasn't and probably still isn't ready for, for Jews to shed their, their Jewish identity. And Stoppard told me the moment when he realized he was Jewish. So he was brought up by this non-Jewish, his father had died when Stoppard was, was very young and he was brought up by an officer in the British army, um, not Jewish, they lived in, um, in Singapore. And it was only when he visited one of his, he met one of his relatives um, that he started asking that relative, well, you know, why, uh, what happened to your husband? And what happened to this person? What happened to that person? And the answer is they died in, in the war. They died in the war. They died in the war. They died in the war. And Stoppard said to me, he said, so I said, why did our family keep on dying in the war? You know, what's the, what, 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 kind, what kind of hobby is that? And uh, they said, we're Jewish, and it was the Shoah. And at that moment, Stoppard realized um, that, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether he didn't know he was Jewish, because it, he, his first wife came from a very Jewish re religious family in, in Newcastle, Miriam, Miriam Stern was her, her name. But he says it, it, it dawned on him when he found out that a whole generation of his family had been, had been wiped out. And, um, and it, uh, at that moment of discovery is is the third act of the play, and it's probably the most powerful uh, most powerful part of, of, of the play altogether. All, all um, I, I haven't. I'm probably going to mispronounce your name. Uh, is it David, or do we just go David? David's good. Yeah, da David is is good. Um, is good. Can we just yeah. ask you about the people behind you? Oh, that that's just a background. They're not really there. They're not real people. They're <laughs> They were real people. It's just a picture. It's a background. Um, that was uh, uh, a conference I, I went to in Britain. But um, I, I haven't read the book, but I was going to ask if if you have no interest at all in football, does the book still stand up? Because I have no interest. What else? To... Football kind of passes me by. Absolutely. Okay, well, I, I can't imagine a world without football, so I'm wow. no good at this <laughs> at, at all. Um, so uh, Lee's an Arsenal fan, so what does he know about football? So, okay, Lee, will it work for someone who doesn't know about football? No, what do you think? Sorry. No, I haven't read the book. Would, would the book work if you're not a football fan? I, I doubt it. <sighs> I mean, from what that lady who was sitting in the garden said, it sounded like uh, football was the sort of greater proportion rather than the 
Holocaust. So, uh, and and we do know that people who don't like football don't like football. I mean, it's a, a bit of a black and white sort of issue. We we've got a group of friends. We were quite amazed. We were with a group of friends in Haifa, Eng English friends in Haifa the other night, and we were going on about the Euro, and they were sitting there going, "What?" And when we said, "But but it's going on," you know, England doing well, you know, and they were like, "But it's football. We're not interested." So I think, unfortunately, uh, for people who aren't interested in football, these sort of things are a big no-no. Um, can I just say something, the lady sitting in the garden? Um, <laughs> I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit interested in football. I, found, I think the first two thirds of the book didn't matter if you're not interested in football. The bit, especially the, before the Holocaust, like growing up in Vienna, I, in Hungary, moving to Vienna, all his moving around because there was a lot of Jewishness. A lot of the moves were because he was Jewish or because of anti-Semitism. Um, and then I think once it got to the 50s, which was probably two thirds of the way through, there was then a lot more about football and there was still a bit of Jewishness. But I found the first two thirds was, was really, I really did enjoy it. It was very, very good. The last third I sort of skipped over a bit. But um, so I, I don't think it's a turn off that it's about football. I think it, it was very cleverly done. I don't know what anyone else thinks about that. No, it goes fair comment. Yeah. David, it goes to 288 pages. At 200, you can switch off. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that seems to be the... That's a good deal. The, 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 I, I, think, I think, it re but, think it reads well, frankly, all the way through, but there's no question. If you have no interest in football, you do miss out to a degree. Mm -hmm. because you, you know, when they're naming players that are household names and they're and you're living through things that you're really not familiar with, yes, mm. you'll be missing out to a degree, but yeah, mm. it's still a very good read. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a very good I, read. And if, if, yeah. if, if, if you're interested in the human condition, um, the even rascals are good people, um, the evil people really aren't, um, then, you know, I, I, th I think it works very, very well. And it's written in a really lively style. So it won't take you long to get to page 200. So. No, no, and it stands up as a, it's a it's a good Holocaust book sort of thing. Mm. So you know, I think it is. So it is, is worth reading. Yeah. yeah. Mind if I ask a, a question? Obviously, having have, not having read the book for two years, um, I, I can't remember whether when, whether this episode was mentioned. But um, there was um, an incident where he escaped from the Germans during the war by yeah. jumping from a window with four or five other Jewish people, and they managed to get away. And by amazing coincidence, one of those people who was with him also ended up one of the most famous Jewish managers of all time. I don't know whether you know, but there's um, the Roma team. There was an air crash in Italy in the late 1940s when the whole of the Roma football team were, were, were killed, including the manager. And the manager was, was, was Jewish, and he was one of the four who jumped from the window with Bella Goodman. It's an, an, an amazing coincidence, an amazing story as well. Now, I, I say I'm not too sure whether that's actually in that book or whether I read it from another book, but definitely the, one of those that jumped with him was the famous Roma manager, and they'd won the league. They were the best team in Italy at the time. They, and, and it said that they would have won the Europe, it, had there been a European Cup in the late 40s, um, it, they would have won the Cup. Um, and I say he unfortunately, with all the other, the whole, the whole play, everybody was wiped out in the plane crash in the late forties. Right. I I don't remember it from from the book, but like you, I read the book properly a while back. But um, I, I've been reviewing it over the weekend, so I I don't think it is mentioned. I, I've read the book. I've read the book recently, fully, and it is not in the book. Right. But the jumping from the window or the about the Roma manager. About the Roma manager. But it, the, the jumping from the window is in the book. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I thought it would be. Uh, yeah. yeah, that sounds like it should be. Right. Um, I, I, I was, as I was rereading the last chapters about the anti Semitism here, the anti Semitism there, and everywhere, um, I, I was brought to mind of a, a book recently written by David Bedill. And I'd like mm. to, to, to ask people how, how this looks. David Bill's written this book, um, which is, as a book, it's immensely readable, um, where he points out how, um, whilst we're, thank God, becoming very sensitive to racism, 
and society is is trying to deal with it, um, those same same levers that are being pulled to protect um, people against uh, racism against black people are not being pulled to stop racism against Jewish people. On the contrary, the, the hands on the levers of stopping racism in society generally are often the people who are cause who are behind anti-Semitism. Um, and I actually came away from David Badil's book feeling um, he's he, it, it's not the case. The, 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 the Britain we live in is not this anti-Semitic place where um, almost at every street corner you're going to be offended for insulted for being Jewish. I've met lots of people who who have insulted me, but my Jewishness was just uh, um, a handle in, in, in which to, on, on which to hang their, their insult. But the insult was much more about me than my, my Jewishness. And I was wondering whether something similar is going on towards the end of this book, um, that all this anti-Semitism is, is in the mind of the beholder and is, is, is not really genuine. Um, I don't know how people feel about that. I don't know if anyone else has read David Padil's book. Um, has anyone else read David Padil? But well, it's a very good good read. I can't remember what it's called. It just came out in the last few months. And he's sitting at Chelsea listening to anti-Semitic abuse of, of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. Um, and he, he was saying if this was a, a black club, no one would, would, would allow this. And he, he really seems to see lots of anti-Semitism in British, British society. And um, is all this anti-Semitism that um, the author finds in the world of football, is that really all, all, all there? I'd, Simon, did you think it was? It was... Um, well, if you look at page 230, um, where he, almost the first time where he talks about it, having been called saying, training like a wonder rabbi, etc. Um, and then he says, and, the, and the, the bottom says, of course, even as his out outrage led him to speak his mind about anti-Semitism for the first and only time on record, Gutman was holding an enormous amount in reserve. And then he, he sort of lists all the examples, which most certainly do sound like anti-Semitism when he was sacked, for this following anti-Jewish laws and, and so on. So I think in the context of his life, Yes, there was real anti-Semitism all the way through. Not of the type that you're talking about, where yes, it can be an easy one to, to hang it on, but it's not actually the cause. Very cruelly, Johnny, I'm going to ask you if you've read the book. I haven't. I've, you haven't, I've, okay. I've, 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 no, we needed someone to advise whether it would be of interest to a non-football specialist. Oh, like me, you mean? As a Chelsea fan, obviously you qualify for that. So, uh, um, um, no, I haven't read it. It's I'm taking it away on holiday with me, assuming I get away. But well, get away or not get away, you should definitely definitely read the book. I think it's yeah. yeah I'm looking forward to it. Uh, can I turn it the other way? Do you think it's a book that would be read by footballing enthusiasts, or would it turn them off that it's about the Holocaust, or would someone who hasn't got any interest in the Holocaust read it? Um, well, I, I noticed that on the back, the, the two reviewers, two of the reviewers, one Patrick Barks, the other one's Oliver Holt, who I don't think have ever written about the Holocaust before. They're very senior football journalists. And they've, they've opened the book and they thought it was absolutely fantastic. So um, if, at, if at that level mm -hmm. it's had some kind of impact, I don't think it's being read on the terraces mm -hmm. of, of football clubs. I think at, the, you know, at, at that level, especially anyone who can remember that Benfica team and what was going on at the time and how Benfica, just the, you know, Benfica ruled Europe and then nothing. So that's, you know, we don't, we don't tend to have that, you know, teams do really well. Well, that was his curse. He, he well, also put curse. curse. Yes. That was so his curse. I, I think it's an intriguing story for any follower of football. And Eusebio, who he, as I say, discovered in, in a barber shop, um, was the greatest European player of his decade. I don't think anyone would take that away. So I think that I, I think in, in football circles, maybe it is being being read. Um, 
but I, you know, the, the, the serious issue about anti-Semitism in football is, is obviously for the moment being um, uh, flooded um, and, um, and people are a lot more worried about uh, racism in football, probably quite, quite, quite rightly. So um, are we about to see a load, a load of skinheads trying to scrape the swastikas off their, their bald heads and um, <laughs> regret anti-Semitism. I'm not sure it's quite about to happen, quite like, quite like that. So, um, so from my point of view, thank you very much for listening to, to me talking about a book I really loved and talking about my own personal family, which really means a lot to me. And I'm really gonna hand over to Simon. Thank you very much. Well, so first of all, just thank you everyone for what I hope we all agree was a, a wonderful evening. Bella Gutman certainly was a remarkable man. And, and thank you, Michael, for your superb performance. You never disappoint. That is honestly said and is true. So a huge thank you. Um, our next book club event is going to be on 23rd of September and we'll be reviewing House of Glass, if you can see this in front of me, the invitations have just gone out by Hadley Freeman. Um, it's a moving account of a family's history that has been thoroughly re researched and magnificently written. If you see the, the um, on the back of the book by Nigella Lawson, Salman Rashdie and many others, uh, the extent of compliments, it was highly recommended to me. I've not yet read it, but a close friend of mine who recommended it to me was euphoric about it. Um, so yes, so, so looking forward to, to, to that one. Uh, and th thank you all for um, thank you all for attending.